but I trusted in thee, O Lord. I said, thou art my God. My times are in thy hand. Deliver me from the hand of mine enemies and from them that persecute me. Let's bow our heads and hearts in a word of prayer with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Would you ask the Lord to speak uh, to you today? Ask the Lord to speak to you today and to give you from his word just what you need. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for the opportunity to be with your people again today. We thank you for the good report we had from Brother David and Jennifer and what you're doing through them in the Basque country. Lord, bless that ministry. Use them for your glory as they return. Be with their children here studying and working. Lord, help them to know that we care about them and are praying for them as well. But Father, as we approach your word today, we certainly need your help. We need you to be the divine teacher and guide through the topic today. Minister to our hearts, speak to us, illuminate us through your Holy Spirit. Use this time to glorify your name. We ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. We've been talking about truth. A few weeks ago, we saw our church theme as a whole, speaking the truth in love. And we saw that truth is our what? Review, okay? Foundation, all right? Speaking is our obligation, and love is our motivation, all right? Speaking the truth in love. And so what we're doing, we're looking at different topics from that Sunday to now and on through several more topics. We're seeing what the Bible says, what truth is about different topics. Some are, are easier to deal with than others. Some are what the world may call controversial, but there is no controversy when you look at it in God's Word. Uh, first, we looked in the mirror. We talked about the truth about Sunday and how we need each other and need to be faithful to the Lord's house as we prepare to do battle there and win people to Christ there. We need community. We need this here. And then we looked a little closer in the mirror the Sunday after that, the truth about us. Uh, we don't, it's not what we think or what our heart tells us, it's what God says in His Word. The only authority that we have is the Word of God. Not what I think, not what I feel, not my opinion, but what does God say in the Word? And then last week we talked about the truth about life. And we touched on the topic of abortion. Uh, it's something that you will hear a lot about. In fact, a lot of these topics will come uh, to the forefront over the next several weeks as we approach the election in November. And this, these are not election rallies or political rallies. These are things that we need to know what God says and what we believe and why, according to Scripture, we believe the truth about these topics. And I hope, the, as I looked at the message, at the songs for today and the choir song and the special Glorify Thy Name and the different songs talking about God and His mercy and who He is, I thought this message really doesn't fit so well with all that. And sometimes, usually, most every time I look forward to preaching the message God gives for a Sunday morning, not so much today. But I do look forward to doing God's will. And I do look forward to showing and reminding our, us what God says about all these different topics. Because today, we're, last week we talked about the truth about life and the, fa and the failure and the trouble of abortion. Today we see the truth about death. Death is not a pleasant topic. It's a very difficult subject. So I hope through the songs today, you know, we sing songs not just to pass the time to the preaching, right? We sing songs to prepare our hearts to focus our hearts on what God has for us for that day. And, and we sang the songs about God, and everything's for Him, and everything's about Him, and everything's for His glory. And so I hope we focus so much on God today that it doesn't cast a pall over our minds and hearts when we consider the topic of death. Because today, that's what we're going to talk about. And, and I know last week, talking about abortion, that was a heavy topic. But listen, we are in difficult times. Times when the world says, well, we know what the Bible says, but these are new times. Well, these are new times, but the Bible is still the Word of God. And the Bible is just as fresh and relevant today as it was the day it was written. So today, another difficult subject, death. And there's so much we could say here, so much we could talk about. But I want us to focus, I want us to focus on the biblical truth <clears throat> of suicide. That is a topic that is not covered a lot in church. 
It's not taught. It's not always preached. And really, it doesn't need to be preached. It needs to be taught from God's Word. And so we're going to talk about suicide, whether it be by one's own hand, physician-assisted suicide. You heard of euthanasia, death with dignity, in quotation marks it's often called. And that's what I want us to consider today. So you understand what I mean by I hope we focus on God so far, right? Because we need to face this. There's so much we could discuss on this topic. But today we're going to see what God says. We're going to lay a foundation, a biblical foundation. There are so many statistics and scientific studies, medical studies, psychological studies. There's so much we could cover with this topic. But we're not here to do that. We're here to see what the Bible says. And let me say, as we talked last week about the subject of abortion, it's something to be taught. It's something to speak the truth in love. And this is the same. There are many perhaps here that have been touched by this tragedy. Maybe you've had a loved one close to you take his or her own life. I know it's happened, and you would probably be shocked at the ones here. Sometimes when things happen to us, we feel as if we're the only ones, right? You ever felt that way? But it's not necessarily true. Most of the time it's not true. I think if we did a show of hands, and we're not going to, we're not going there today, but if we were to do a show of hands, how many of you have been directly touched by a close family member, a close friend, someone you were shocked at, and that person took his or her own life? There would be a surprise of how many have been touched by that today. But it goes beyond one taking his or her own life. It goes beyond this idea of physician-assisted suicide. It goes into the idea of euthanasia. We have states in our country where physician-assisted suicide is legal and it happens. And around the world today, uh, I mean, life is sacred, whether it be in the womb or whether it be in the nursing home, life is sacred. From beginning, from conception to the day of death, life is sacred. So let's talk about this today. And I hope, again, we focus on God and doing things for Him. But let's understand the truth about death. Three very simple thoughts. We'll see some biblical principles concerning death in general. We'll see the biblical perspective concerning suicide and the biblical alternative to suicide. First of all, biblical principles concerning death in general. We hit this last week, covered it well. Life, number one, is a sacred gift from God. Life is a sacred gift from God. Genesis 2-7. Genesis 2-7 says, And the Lord God formed a man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Life doesn't happen without God. And we saw last week it'll never happen in a laboratory, never happen in a test tube. If there is life, it is because of God. Life is a sacred gift from God. The second thing, a second biblical principle in general concerning death, number two, death is an enemy. Death is an enemy. Write down this reference, 1 Corinthians 15, 26. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 says this, The last enemy that shall be destroyed is what? Death. Death is an enemy. Death is not a friend. Death is not a relief. Death is not a release necessarily from problems. Death is an enemy. So we've seen God is the source of life. Life is sacred. It comes from God. Death is an enemy. Number three, this third biblical principle. We're moving quickly so we can spend time at the end in what I think really matters this morning. Number three, death is inevitable. Death is inevitable. Just flip over in the book of Psalms. So flip over to Psalm 89. Psalm number 89 and verse 48. Psalm 89 and verse 48. Here the psalmist says in Psalm 89, 48, what man is he that liveth and shall not see death? It's a rhetorical question. It's, there's an obvious answer. What man is he that liveth and shall not see death? No, we all will see death. Shall he deliver his soul from the hand of the grave? Selah, think about that. Death is inevitable. Now, we know that the rapture, and we've talked about the rapture, the coming of Christ to take his church home. Those who go up in the rapture will not see death. But as a rule, death is inevitable. One day, it will come, 
and knock on your door. One day it will come and knock on my door. So as we lay the foundation for what the Bible says, the truth about death, there are some biblical principles. Life is a sacred gift from God. Death, on the other hand, is an enemy. Death is inevitable. Number four, our time here between conception and the grave, our time here is in God's hands. We read that back in Psalm 31 in our text, verse 15. My times, David says, are in thy hand. You see, David was going through a hard time. If you look at David, you see people attacking him. You see him in trouble. You see him internally conflicted. You see him sp spent with grief, his years with sighing, failing strength, his bones consumed. Nobody liked him. Everybody hated him, all right? And when he would go out, people would run from him. He was not living, in, his, in our minds, a good life. Things were upside down. Things just weren't going right. But he said this but I'm going to trust God. Because my times, what happens to me, my going out and my coming in, the issues of my life, the path of my life is in God's hands. And I will trust God. You know, it's easy to trust God when everybody loves you. It's easy to trust God when you're not consumed with grief. It's easy to trust God when the bones aren't consumed. It's easy to trust God when you're not a reproach. But it's, it takes a conscious decision to say everything is against me. But I will trust God. Because I know my time here is in God's hands. Biblical principles concerning death. But there's a couple of more. One, uh, number five it would be. Our time here is in God's hands. And number five, our time here is for God's glory. Our time here is for God's glory glory. If I'm here for God's glory, then I don't have the right to change that. I don't have the right to stipulate what I think my time here should be. Our time here is for God's glory. Romans eleven thirty six. jot that reference down. Romans eleven thirty six. For of him, speaking of God, and through him and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. Everything's for God. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Familiar verse, and sometimes we don't apply it as far-reaching as it could be, and, and I think it applies well to the idea of death. It can apply to the idea of self-harm, and we'd love to turn a blind eye to things like that. But listen, folks, these are real topics. These are real issues. These are what our young people, young adults, middle aged even children sometimes, the idea of considering taking a life, their own life, self-harm, cutting. Listen, folks, it's real. And if you don't think it is, you've got your head in the sand. So let's just understand these principles. How do we deal with that? How do we help? Like I said, this is when I thought about the topic today with the missionary here of all things too. It's like, wow. But you know what, folks? This is what we need to know. This is what the truth is about living here in a sin-cursed world. Our time here is for God's glory. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. What? Don't you know this? Know you not that your body... Not just your soul, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in what, first of all? Your body. And in your spirit, <clears throat> which are God's. Our time here in the flesh is for God's glory. Biblical principles concerning death. Just some general things to look at. Life is a sacred gift from God. Death is an enemy. Death is inevitable, but our time here is in God's hands. Let's trust Him for that. And our time here is for God's glory. And one more principle in a general sense about death. God's command is clear. God's command is clear. Exodus 20, 13. What do we find in Exodus 20? The Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. Thou shalt not kill. 
And we always think of murder, but basically the taking of a life goes outside of the will of God. Whether it be a murder, whether it be taking my own life, God's command is clear. So those are just general biblical principles concerning death. Things that perhaps you already knew, things you thought about. But number two, let's be more specific. What is the biblical perspective concerning suicide? The taking of one's own life. What does the Bible teach about that? The biblical perspective concerning suicide. You know, uh, you know, God, we talked about his omniscience. Uh, was it last Sunday night? Was it just last Sunday night? We talked about God's omniscience and the practicality, what it means to us, the blessing and the fact that God knows everything and God's omniscience. I'm glad he put hard things in Scripture. I'm glad he put people in Scripture that struggle. I'm glad he put, let David write some songs where David says, things ain't so good today for me. Where David's talking to himself and says, why are you cast down, O oh my soul? Why are you just so... Why, why? And, and so we see all the emotions in Psalms, the highs and the lows and everywhere in between. There's a lot of tough topics dealt with in Scripture. There are a lot of, and I call them ugly scenes, but God put real living in his word so we can look at that and say, you know what, this is nothing new what I'm facing and what our world is facing. There are several examples of people taking their own lives in Scripture. And we'll just run through these. In Judges chapter 16, there's Samson. Remember Samson? In Judges chapter 16, now, I wish we could study each one. We don't have time. But Samson, uh, was, he was a Philistine killer. He was taking out the Philistines and God's judge uh, for Israel, taking out the Philistines, the, the oppressors of Israel. But one day he gave in to temptation and he lost his strength. They had him grinding in the prison house. They, cha they chained him up between two pillars of a large house and they made fun of him and were laughing at him, but his strength was back. But he died. He took his own life so he could take a lot of Philistines with him. And that's what he did. But he took his own life. King Saul and his armor bearer. King Saul was in the latter years of his reign. God had already rejected him as king. David had been anointed, but King Saul was still the king. And in battle he was wounded. And he knew that if the enemy took him, he would be tortured. It would be shamed. And so he told his armor bearer, run me through with your sword. And the armor bearer says, I'm not doing it. So King Saul fell on his own sword and took his own life. And when the armor bearer saw that, he took his life. Now, less, lesser known figure in second figure in 2 Samuel 17, Ahithophel. Anybody ever heard of Ahithophel? 2 Samuel 17, verse 23, Ahithophel was giving counsel to Absalom. How Absalom, as the rebellion to, to take his father David off the throne, David's son Absalom wanted to take over the kingdom. And Ahithophel said, let's do it this way. And then Absalom asked someone else, and they said, well, let's do it this way. And God was in that to give David time to escape. But when Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he, he was shamed because what he thought wasn't followed, he took his own life. He hanged himself. And then you come to a lesser known figure named Zimri. You say, well, I've never heard of Zimri, probably because he was the king of Israel, the northern kingdom, uh, that only ruled for seven days. He was, he was anointed king and the, throne, the, the crown placed on his head. Seven days later, his kingdom was gone, another king was in place, and he was so distraught, he went into his home, torched his house, and died in the flames. He took his own life. So you have Samson, King Saul, his armor bearer, Ahithophel, Zimri, and then the most well-known of all, Judas Iscariot. When he saw how things went after his betrayal of Jesus Christ, from what I see in Scripture and what the Bible seems to infer, he wasn't really pleased with the outcome. He thought it was something else would happen. We don't know all the details. But he was so distraught at the result of his betrayal of Christ, he went out and hanged himself. So in Scripture, God in His infinite wisdom showed us these situations. Samson was motivated by revenge. King Saul wanted to avoid 
difficult circumstances. Ahithophel was so shamed by his peers, he took his life. Zimri said, it's over for me, my position's gone, my identity's gone, I might as well take my life, and he did. And Judas didn't like the way things were turning out in his life, and he took his own life. So it's there. And so we talk about it. So what is the biblical perspective concerning suicide? Here are some truths to consider. Number one, suicide is not a sin that automatically sends someone to hell. Suicide is wrong. It is a sin. To be, what else can I say? But it's not one that sends someone to hell. There are those, even religions and churches that teach, there are different classifications of sin. And if you commit this sin, well, that's a mortal sin. And if you take your own life, you don't have a shot of getting into heaven. You will go directly to hell and burn forever if you take your own life. That's not what the Bible teaches. 1 John 1, 7. Look at 1 John 1, 7. 1 John 1, 7. You know what it says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from what? All sin. And that all, what does all mean? You know what that all means in the Greek? Real simple, all. Past, present, future. And we talked about this, when someone comes to know Christ, he is saved forever, and it is not a sin because someone takes his or, own life, his or her own life, that is not the reason, the sin, that sends someone to hell. In our first ministry in Mexico, in Cuernavaca, there is an American who had married a Mexican, and they lived there, they were in our church, and, and he uh, had smoked all his life, gotten throat cancer, and was in terrible condition, had to have the voice box and all the vocal cords and all that, and he had, I don't know the medical terms, maybe you do, but the hole in his throat, and to talk, he had to place his thumb here. And it, his life was, was rough. And I had him come and speak to our teenagers in the church. And, and, and just the dangers of tobacco and smoking and what it can do. And, and he gave his testimony here. And he came to me not long after that and said, Brother Joe, <clears throat> I'm miserable. A believer. He said, I can't take it anymore. I want to take my own life. And the only reason I'm not going to take my life is because I know if I took my own life, I'd go straight to hell. Right? What would you have said? I want to say, yeah, that's right. <laughs> but you can't do that. I said, brother, here's what the Bible says. Here's the truth. I says, no, you know Christ. You'd go to heaven. But here's what the Bible says. And we went through the scriptures that we'll talk about in just a minute. But it's not something that automatically condemns someone to hell. So for the unbeliever, what is suicide? Suicide for the unbeliever means there is no more opportunity to accept Christ. Listen, as long as someone's breathing, as long as there is life, there is hope. As long as someone's alive, there is hope of trusting Christ. The only deadline that someone can cross where salvation then is impossible is the deadline of death. Once we step into eternity, there is no more opportunity for salvation. And Revelation 20 makes it very clear. Those whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life were cast into the lake of fire. And an unbeliever who takes his or her own life the physician that helps that person, and I understand, and we'll talk about it in just a minute, that's very difficult to watch a loved one suffer. And it's very difficult to be the one suffering. But for the unbeliever, that is a line that is crossed, and hell is all that awaits. And so as bad as it is here, it's even worse when life is ended. For the unbeliever, there's no more opportunity to accept Christ. That unbeliever doesn't go to hell because he or she committed suicide. The unbeliever goes to hell because he doesn't know Christ as personal Savior. Bottom line. What about the believer? Well, the believer will still go to heaven. Jesus says, 
I, I look at it. I'm, I was going to quote it, but I just went blank. And that happens. John chapter 10. Look at verse 27. We saw this, boy, just a week or two ago. We referenced this. John 10, 27. I love these verses. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, Jesus said, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. No man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. In other words, once you are in Christ, no one and nothing takes you out. The devil can't take you out. So-and-so can't take you. You can't take yourself out. God's got you. The believer will go to heaven. But opportunities and rewards will be missed. Look at this. Back in the back of the New Testament, the book of 2 John. John wrote three letters that are in the back of the New Testament. 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. Look at 2 John. Only one chapter, so look down at verse number 8. 2 John and verse 8. Here the apostle writes, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. A full reward. Our times are in His hands. God may have something special for someone to do. And if I take my life, I've missed that opportunity. I've missed the will of God. There are rewards, maybe people's lives that God could use me to touch. I go to heaven, but those opportunities are lost. And then there's that verse in Scripture in Romans 14 that says, So then, every one of us will give an account to the Lord. I have to get, I go to heaven. I, re, I enjoy heaven by giving account for what I gave up, what I didn't accomplish. The truth about death. There are general biblical principles. The Bible gives a perspective on suicide. It's real, it happens. In fact, it's in the top, it's, it's, it's like, I think it, worldwide it's like the 17th leading cause of death for what I saw this week. I know you thought, I thought it was higher. When you take everything else in, worldwide, but it's still top 20. That's huge. And, and you see examples in Scripture. But it's, it's not the mortal sin some proclaim it to be. For the unbeliever, it's just no more chance for salvation. For the believer, lost opportunity. So what is the biblical alternative? Is there an alternative to suicide? And you know what? As I went through this, this isn't just good to share with those that are contemplating taking his or her own life. It's good for those left behind. If you've been touched by this, or you know someone that's been touched by this, you know the pain. You know things that I, I can't grasp because it hasn't happened to me. And I don't pretend to understand. I don't try to understand because the fact of the matter is there's no way someone who hasn't been through that with a loved one or a close friend can understand like a loved one or a close friend. And so these verses, just these principles and the alternative to suicide isn't just good for those thinking about taking his or her own life, but it's good for those who have had to live with that loss. Number one, God's complete forgiveness. Oft times, suicide happens because of guilt. Oft times, for those who have lost someone close to them because of suicide, there is overwhelming guilt. But God's complete forgiveness. Look at Hebrews 8.12. Hebrews 8.12 Wonderful biblical principle of forgiveness. God says, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. God's complete forgiveness. That helps us with guilt. But sometimes it's just an overwhelming, seemingly overwhelming circumstances drive people to take their life. Or those left behind, it's just it's too much to bear. Thoughts race through the sleepless nights. What, what if I'd have done this? Couldn't I have done this? Why didn't I see it? Why, why hasn't... 
all these questions race through our minds, and it just seems to be like a tidal wave. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Again, this is a familiar passage. But you know why 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10 are so familiar? Because it's so good and so needed. Paul had a circumstance in his life that God wasn't going to take away. The thorn of the flesh. We don't know exactly what all that involved. It could have been a physical. It could have been spiritual oppression. We don't know what it was. But all I know is that Paul asked God three times and God said no three times. And God said, you're going to live with this, Paul. But look at verse 9. He, God, said unto me, Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. God says, my grace will get you through. We sing it, don't we? Amazing grace. Grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me where? Home. Boy, it's fun to sing. It's really hard to live. Will God's grace take you through anything? Yes or no? And it's easy to say yes right now. Sunday morning at, I'm not going to share the time. And don't look at your watch. It's easy to say, yeah, God's grace can. But do you really believe it? Are you willing to live it? Are you willing to trust it? Say, God, I can't. I need your grace to lead me. God's powerful grace deals with the overwhelming circumstances. God's complete forgiveness. God's powerful grace. Go to Philippians 4 for the third alternative. And maybe you come up with more, but these are four that I think will be quite helpful Philippians chapter 4, Philippians 4, verse 6. And we're studying the book of Philippians now on Wednesday nights, and I trust you'll be here for that. We just, we're just into chapter 1, first few verses now. But Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing. Don't be anxious about anything. Easier said than done. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and what? Minds. Your hearts and your minds. How you think, what you see, how you see what's happening to you through Christ Jesus. God's complete forgiveness, God's powerful grace, God's keeping peace. God's complete forgiveness helps us with guilt. God's powerful grace sees us through the over, seemingly overwhelming circumstances. God's keeping peace deals with the depression, deals with conflict. God says, don't worry, bring it to me. And how foolish I am if I try to do it all myself. God says, here, give it to me. Casting all your care upon him. Peter wrote, why? Because he cares for you. Why do we try to carry it? We give it to God, but it's like a yo-yo, right? Remember yo-yos? How many of you used to play with yo-yos? Man, you could throw that thing out, well, what happens? It comes right back. You throw it down, it comes back, supposedly comes back up. How many of you could do all the tricks with the yo-yos? I used to could. I, there's a lot of used to coulds in my life. But that's how we give our burdens. Yeah, we throw it on God, but then what happens? We just snatch it right back. We cast our burdens and, we, and then we figure out how am I going to do it tomorrow. The hardest thing is to do what the song says. Take your burdens to the Lord. What's the old song say? Leave it there. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. But God's peace, if I can do that, it helps me deal with the conflict and the depression. God's keeping peace. It doesn't just keep my heart. If you've ever been depressed, what happens? What does your mind do? It just races. It races. Nonstop. You wake up four or five in the morning and it's going. You try to go to sleep at night and it's just spinning, spinning, spinning. God's peace is the only thing that helps. God's complete forgiveness, God's powerful grace, God's keeping peace. The last of all, look at 1 John 4 verse 18. The biblical alternative to suicide, God's for complete forgiveness, God's powerful grace, God's keeping peace. Number four, God's perfect love. There is no fear, 1 John 4, 18 says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear hath what? Torment. It tortures us. 
He that feareth is not made perfect in love. God's perfect love deals with rejection. Deals with the fear of how am I going to face tomorrow? I'm so scared. God's love. God's perfect love. And there may be someone here today, this idea of suicide has crossed your mind. I don't know. I have no clue. But trust me, do you really believe God loves you? Because he does. Maybe you've battled with it in your life because someone close to you has taken his or her own life, or a relative, a friend. Maybe you have a friend that's facing that. Understanding the love of God makes all the difference in the world. Not just here, but knowing it here. God's perfect love. I'm glad this message is over. We'll move on to something else. Because some of the things we'll look at over the next few weeks, you'll say, yeah, boy, yeah, they just need to understand that. These are things we need to understand. Because it's not just the lost that have to that contemplate suicide and take their own lives. A lot of Christians battle it. You say, well, I just don't understand how they do it. Because it's real. The torture in here is real. The, the, the despondency here is real. And sometimes it looks like the only way out. But the Bible does give. Through God's forgiveness, God's grace, God's peace, God's love, there is an alternative. The purposeful taking of life, whether it be my own life, as a physician helping someone else, goes against Scripture and is never a true solution. Listen, God is the giver of life. And he is the only one that has the right to say when that's over. This is the truth about death. It's what the Bible says. And here we can find comfort and strength. Listen, our time, it says, our times are in his hands. But listen carefully as we close. Our times here, from conception to the grave, are in God's hands. But the preparation for the grave is in ours. Are you ready for eternity? Are you ready? Only two options, heaven and hell. Just two. We were all born on our way to hell. All of us. We're all sinners. But I have good news. Jesus came and he died. He was buried and he rose again. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you know for sure that when God says, okay, your time's up. Do you know for sure you're going to heaven? If not, I have great news. It's been a heavy topic today, but now we've got a glorious topic. You can know you're going to heaven through Jesus Christ. I hope you know that today. The truth, speaking the truth in love. We live our lives by the truth of God's word. Let's pray together. With our heads bowed and eyes closed. With heads bowed and eyes closed. I hope and I pray, I should say, this has been a help. Maybe you know someone that you can share some of these principles with. The alternative. Here's what God says. Here's his love. Here's his grace. Here's his peace. Here's his forgiveness. And maybe you are struggling because of what has happened to you. There is God's grace. There is God's forgiveness. There is God's peace. There is God's love. Embrace it. David said, my life is a mess, but I trusted Lord in thee so when our lives are a mess we can still trust him and God will help us through we can still look to him I don't know how God's spoken to your heart today but would you lift your heart to him sir ma'am young person if you died today would you go to heaven if not open your heart to Christ trust him today let his forgiveness and his grace his peace and his love make you his child Father, use this time for your glory in Jesus' name. With your head still bowed and your eyes still closed, I'll ask you to stand, please, with an, an attitude of reverence, an attitude of prayer, with heads bowed and eyes closed. Would you lift your heart to the Lord? Perhaps you need to come and kneel, as some do, as always available, and just pray. Say, God, let me help that person you put on my heart. Lord, help me. If I can be a help to you, 
through anything you're thinking or going through. Let's go to God's Word together. I don't have any solutions, but God has all the answers in His Word. Let's look there. Would you lift your heart to God? Let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you for the time in your word. Lord, I pray you would take the scriptures that have been presented today, the biblical principles, and shape them and mold them to fit the need of every single heart. Lord, if there's someone here without absolute assurance of eternal life, I pray that heart would be open to the saving power and forgiveness of Christ today. Lord, help us to be faithful this week to speak the truth in love. In Jesus' name, amen.